Hello everybody, this video is on titration graphs for different types of acids and bases. Before we go through different types of titration graphs, it's important to run through a few important terminologies. The equivalence point in titration refers to the point at which an acid and base react in the stoichiometric ratios to reach a complete point of neutralization. So this means when we have base and a monoprotic acid, we have the same moles of both compounds reacting to form the salt and water. The stoichiometric ratio between an acid and base doesn't need to be necessarily 1 to 1 all the time. It can be 2 to 1, whereby we need 2 moles of sodium hydroxide for every 1 mole of a diprotic acid, for example, sulfuric acid. And this again gives us a salt and water. The ratio can also be 3 to 1, whereby there are 3 moles of sodium hydroxide needed to neutralize 1 mole of a triprotic acid for example, phosphoric acid. No matter the ratio of reaction, there will be no acid and base in excess at the equivalence point during a titration. In an acid-base titration, we typically use indicators to determine when this equivalence point will occur, as this will give us information to help us calculate the concentration of either an unknown acid solution or base solution. So when we're picking an indicator, the aim is so that the indicator will change color when the equivalence point of the titration occurs. Since indicators change colors at different pHs, we have a wide variety of indicators to choose from. The pH of the final solution during titration at the equivalence point is an important factor to consider when choosing an appropriate indicator. The pH depends on the nature of the salt produced. In a different video, I go through different types of salt in more detail. As a review, neutral salts will give you a pH of 7, acidic salts will produce an acidic pH less than 7, and basic salts will give you a pH of solution greater than 7. And of course, these numbers are all at 25 degrees Celsius. There will be another term you will hear about in titration, and that is end point. While equivalence point is related to the stoichiometric ratio that's required to reach complete neutralization, the word endpoint refers to when the indicator changes color. When we are choosing the indicator, we want to pick an indicator so that its endpoint is close to the equivalence point, so that its endpoint and the equivalence point of the titration occur simultaneously. When the indicator changes color, the equivalence point of the titration is reached at the same time. Therefore, the appropriateness or the suitability of an indicator depends on the type of salt produced. The type of salt depends on the type of acid and base that are used in the titration. This could be a combination of strong acid, strong base, strong acid, weak base, weak acid and strong base, or weak acid and weak base. We'll go through each combination in detail individually. A strong acid and strong base titration always produces a neutral salt, which means at the equivalence point, the pH of the resultant solution in the conical flask will always be 7. An example of a strong acid and strong base titration is the one between sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. The neutral salt formed is sodium chloride. The titration graph of a strong acid and strong base titration typically looks like if we have the acid in the conical flask, the pH of the solution will start off very low as it is acidic, and as the base is being added from the burette, the pH slowly increases. When it's about to hit the equivalence point, the pH increases very steeply. At the pH of 7, which is marked by the letter S in this diagram, this is where the equivalence point of the titration occurs. Similarly, if we start with the base in the conical flask, the pH will start very high as it is basic, and it will slowly decrease in the beginning as the acid is being added from the burette. And as it approaches the equivalence point, the pH will quickly decrease much more steeply until it reaches a pH of 7 again at the equivalence point. There are numerous indicators that are suitable for acid-base titration for a titration between a strong acid and a strong base. These include bromothalmic blue, phenolphthalein, and methyl orange. Now you might wonder, if the pH of a resultant solution for this titration is at 7, how come these indicators where the pH ranges are nowhere close to 7 are also considered as appropriate. Let me show you. On this diagram, I've taken one of the titration graphs from before and I've overlaid it with the three indicators that we saw before. 
phenolphthalein, which is changes color from pink to colorless from about 8.3 to 10 pH. Romothamol blue changes from a blue color to yellow, roughly around the neutral pH range. And methyl orange changes from yellow to red between a pH of 4.4 and 3. As the acid is being added, the pH of the solution decreases very slowly at the beginning. And as it approaches the equivalence point, the change in pH is steep and is almost vertical. This means with a small this means the pH decreases much more for the same volume of acid that's being added from the burette. When the last drop of acid is added to reach the equivalence point, the pH changes from a very basic value all the way down to a very acidic value. That one drop of acid that's being added from the burette causes the solution to change from a very high pH to a very low pH. Now, this change is visualized as a vertical line on the graph, and I want you to see that this line crosses the endpoint of all three indicators. The endpoint refers to the point at which the indicator changes color. When the equivalence point occurs at this volume of acid, phenolphthalein will change from pink to colorless, bromothamol blue will change from blue to yellow, and methyl orange will change from yellow to a red or orange color. So the reason why all three indicators are suitable for this titration is because the pH changes so steeply around the equivalence point. So this is the reason why most indicators are suitable for strong acid and strong base titration. Next, we'll look at a titration between strong acid and weak base. This combination of acid and base usually produces an acidic salt. The acidic salt at the equivalence point will cause the solution to have a pH of less than 7. And as an example, I have ammonia, which is a weak base, titrated with hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, and it produces the acidic salt, which is ammonium chloride. The reason why the solution becomes acidic is because ammonium is the conjugate acid of ammonia, which is a weak base. So it is able to ionize with water, whereby it donates a proton to water to form ammonia, and more importantly, the water is transformed into hydronium ion, which causes the solution to become acidic. On the titration graph, because the equivalence point occurs at an acidic pH, the whole graph is shifted downwards. The equivalence point can be found at a pH below 7. This is a great example to demonstrate why some indicators are not suitable for strong acid and weak base titration. A good example of this is phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein changes color between roughly 8 and 10 pH. At the volume of acid added whereby the equivalence point occurs, phenolphthalein has already changed color long before that. Whereas methyl orange, which is a far better indicator for this titration, changes from a yellow color into a red color. This is the reason why methyl orange is an appropriate indicator, whereas phenolphthalein it is not suitable for this titration. A common misconception for students is that strong acid and weak base always produces an acidic salt. There are some exceptions to that rule. An example of this is the titration between carbonate or hydrogen carbonate, which is a weak base, and any type of strong acid. This will produce a neutral salt. So it is always important to consider the composition of the salt produced from the neutralization instead of only looking at the type of acid or base that were used in the titration. By way of review, an acidic salt contains the conjugate acid of a weak base, and an abasic salt contains the conjugate base of a weak acid. Moving on, what about a weak acid and a strong base titration? This combination produces a basic salt, whereby at the equivalence point, the pH of the solution is basic and it is greater than 7. An example of this is the reaction between potassium hydroxide, which is a strong base, and hydrofluoric acid, which is a weak acid, and that produces the basic salt, potassium fluoride. The fluoride ion is responsible for the basic pH as it ionizes water by gaining a proton from water to form hydrofluoric acid and, more importantly, hydroxide ions. Since the equivalence point of this titration is above 7, on the graph, the whole curve is shifted upwards such that the equivalence point can be found at a pH above 7. In this example, as you can hopefully see already, phenolphthalein is a perfect indicator. 
because the equivalence point occurs at the same time as the end point, as phenolphthalein changes from pink into a colorless appearance. In contrast, methyl orange it is not appropriate for this titration, as it will only change color long after the equivalence point of the titration has already taken place. The neutralization between a weak acid and weak base can produce either acidic or basic salts. The pH of the resultant solution at the equivalence point varies and it depends on the relative strength of the acid and the base. If the Ka, which is the value that we use to indicate the strength of the acid, is greater than the Kb of the base, then the salt will be acidic and it will produce a pH of less than 7. Vice versa, if the Ka is less than the Kb, the pH will be basic. Titration graphs for a weak acid and weak base titration has a very characteristic shape. It appears to be a lot flatter compared to the other types of titration. And this is due to the formation of buffer systems during the titration process. We'll discuss buffers in a moment. Out of the three options that we were given, bromothermal blue, which is the blue and yellow transition on the graph, is the most appropriate. At the equivalence point, the bromothermal blue will change from a blue color into a yellow color. On some occasions, you'll come across titration involving polyprotic acids. This refers to acids that can donate multiple protons. So for example, Sulfuric acid, which is a diprotic acid. Phosphoric acid is a triprotic acid. Each acidic proton that the acid contains will have its own equivalence point. And this can be clearly visualized on the titration graph. This graph shows you the titration of a diprotic acid. There are two distinctive equivalence points on this graph. The changing pH during a titration of a polyprotic acid may appear to be flatter due to the formation of buffers, as most polyprotic acids are weak in nature. So what do I mean by buffers during titration? In the two examples of titration, one between a weak base and strong acid, and another between a weak base and weak acid, we saw that the change in pH varies in rate throughout the titration. For the weak base and strong acid titration, the pH decreases quite steeply in the beginning, but then quickly flattens afterwards. This flattened region is referred to as a buffer region. And after it moves past the buffer region, the pH then decreases quite rapidly. You can see the same trend in the second example. The pH decreases quite rapidly, followed by a more flat and horizontal graph, which is a buffer region, and after which the pH then decreases more quickly. When there's a weak acid or weak base in the conical flask, the weak acid or weak base will become ionized. Now, let's take weak acid as an example. Because weak acids are partially ionized, there will be some molecules of acid that's unionized in the conical flask. As we add more base to the conical flask, some of the molecules will start to be deprotonated, forming its conjugate base. And this is where we start to form a buffer, because a buffer consists of a comparable amount of a weak acid and its conjugate base. But in the beginning, the buffer and its buffering capacity will be quite ineffective and weak because there are far more weak acid molecules compared to conjugate base molecules. As we add more and more base from the burettes, more weak acid molecules will become conjugate bases as they lose a proton. When we get to a situation whereby the number of acid molecules is roughly equal, if not identical, to the number of conjugate base molecules, we form a special category of buffer whereby the buffering capacity is at maximum capacity. And of course, as we add more and more base, all of the weak acid will be deprotonated, forming more conjugate base. And this is where the buffer will disappear as we have no more weak acid left over in the system. So adding a base to weak acid will create an equilibrium system between a weak acid and its conjugate base. And this is what we refer to as the formation of a buffer. And recall that a buffer in chemistry is a system that will resist changes in pH. So as you're adding more base from the burettes, the pH still increases, but it increases at a much slower rate. This results in a flattened pH curve that we see in the buffering region. As more and more base is added, the buffer system loses its effectiveness because we have decreasing number of weak acid molecules. And this is where we start to see a more rapid rise in pH because the buffer is losing its buffering capacity.
Once the entire buffer stops working, as we have no more weak acid left over, the pH will start to increase much more rapidly. Here's a, another example where we can see a buffer system. A weak base plus a strong acid. In the conical flask, we start with a weak base, and as we add more acid, the weak base will start to gain more protons to form its conjugate acid, which we represent as BH+. And if we have a system between the base and its conjugate acid, we'll start to form a buffer system, and this is shown in the buffer region. When the buffer is present, the addition of acid from the burette still decreases the pH, but at a much slower rate. In some cases, when you have a combination of a strong acid or base with a weak acid or base, you actually do not see a buffer zone. In this example, we have a strong base starting out in a conical flask, so the pH is very high in the beginning. And as we add a weak acid, it decreases. But we don't see a buffer region that we saw earlier. Why is that? Well, it's because when you have a strong base in the conical flask, it is already fully ionized by the definition of a strong base. So when you add more weak acid, you won't be creating a buffer system as a buffer is only formed when there's a weak base and its conjugate acid. When you're using a strong base in the conical flask, there will be no more base left over as they have already fully ionized to produce hydroxyl ions. For example, if we have sodium hydroxide in the conical flask, you will expect all of the sodium hydroxide to form sodium ions and hydroxyl ions. This concludes the video on titration graphs.